I now call to order the Society's 2,418th meeting. In the 149th year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Ellen Stofan in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., including our members and friends around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's meeting on PSW Science's YouTube channel. We will begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2417th meeting and the lecture by Harold Hess on super resolution and 3D imaging. We will then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. When the Q&A session is done, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, thank those who make PSW possible, and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking the sponsors of the 2019-2020 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and a generous donor who has asked to remain anonymous. <laughs> Please also thank our sponsors of another type, the volunteers who have dedicated their time, expertise and care to carrying out the work of the society without compensation, serving science and the public, and maintaining the almost 150-year-old traditions of the society, especially joining me tonight in thanking one of the members of the General Committee, Vice President Mark Clampin. <laughs> okay. I'm pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to the society. Olivia Boykin, a student at the Holton Arms School, interested in chemistry and biochemistry, cell and molecular biology, medicine and neuroscience, who learned a PSW from a science teacher who recommended she attend a meeting. James Carton, a professor of atmospheric and ocean science at the University of Maryland, interested in physical oceanography, ocean climate coupling, data assimilation and modeling, who learned at PSW from the Washington Post. And tonight's speaker, Helen Stofan, whose background and interests will be clear to you in part from tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming them to membership. There is a signed reprint of volume one of the PSW Bulletin for all new members. Please see me after the lecture to pick up your copy if you're a new member and you have not previously obtained yours. And if you purchase the PSW ribbon, please see Camille Vance at the ribbon table to pick it up. Ribbons are also known as rosettes. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2416th meeting in the lecture by Harold Hess on super resolution and 3D imaging delivered to, this, to the Society on December 6, 2019, right here in the Powell Auditorium. But before he does, it's worth noting that some of Harold's recent work discussed in the lecture is reported in the 17th January issue of Science in an article on correlative 3D super resolution and block based EM of whole vitreously frozen cells, which is featured on the cover of that issue of science. And for those of you who are interested in, please read his very nice article. James, the podium is yours to read the minutes of his talk. Thank you, Larry. Hi, good evening, everyone. Those kind of look familiar, right? 
On December 6, 2019, in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club here in Washington, D.C., President Larry Milstein called the 2,417th meeting of the Society to order at 8.08 p.m. He announced the order of business, that the evening's lecture would be live streamed on the internet, and welcomed new members to the Society. The minutes of the previous meeting were then read and approved. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Harold Hess, group leader at the Genalia Research Campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. His lecture was titled, Super Resolution and 3D Imaging, Brain Circuits to Cell Ultrastructures. Around 400 years ago, the first microscopes allowed scientists to observe cells, bacteria, and tissue. In 1873, Ernst Abbey discovered that the diffraction limit of visible light is approximately 200 nanometers. Another advancement in 1931, Ernst Rutzke created the first electron microscope with a resolution of approximately one nanometer, and new staining techniques followed. In 1955, diamond knives were invented as a preferred way of slicing biological tissue for compiling 3D images. Getting closer to our speaker, 1975, after 15 years of imaging and hand coloring, Sidney Brenner successfully mapped the 302 neuron brain of C. elegans, a worm approximately 200 microns long. In the early 2000s, Hess and his colleague, Eric Betzig, learned about a new stain, the green fluorescent protein, or GFP, that glows in the presence of visible light. The GFP allows scientists to genetically label individual cells by the protein of their choice. The protein even works in live cells. Hess and Betzig discovered that the GFP could be turned on and off, allowing them to exceed the diffraction limit by observing single molecules at a time. In 2009, Hess joined Genelia Labs and began his effort to map the approximately 100,000 neurons of the Drosophila brain. It then took eight years to compile the data to map the 400 million pubic micron fly brain to accomplish Hess's team forewent traditional diamond knife cutting, which is used um, to make cuts of approximately 30 nanometer slices at a time. Instead, they used a focused ion beam of gallium atoms, gallium atoms, apologies, to sandblast nanometer level amounts of surface at a time. Hess then showed and explained multiple graphic animations of fly brain imaging, discussing ion beam challenges and solutions encountered in their development. The fly brain is modular, he said, using different sections to operate different life functions. He then described how his team predicted synapses, confirmed them, and partnered with Google to automatically segment them. He announced that in February 2020, Genelia Labs will release the largest dense connectome, including approximately 25,000 traced neurons, 10 million synapses, and 60 million postsynaptic densities. Hess said it is also possible to image neural activity and showed an example of an imaged fly larva with calcium indicators inserted into individual nerves. He said his team's techniques could also image causality in otherwise static circuitry patterns. Hess then showed and explained scans his team took of HeLa cells and mouse liver cells. The speaker then returned to fluorescence microscopy. His team found cryofixation at approximately 10 degrees Kelvin to produce the best image results, as frozen GFP still glows. He then showed high-resolution images and animations created using the cryofixation technique. Hess said these new imaging techniques hold great promise for the future, and highlighted his team's recent work imaging T cells injecting lytic granules into cancer cells, showing each respective cell's offensive and defensive maneuvers. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.48 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting to the social hour. Temperature, 10.5 degrees C. Weather, cloudy. Attendance in the Powell Auditorium, 78. And viewing through the live stream on the PSW Science YouTube channel, 29. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes, aside from its Drosophila melanogaster? 
It's okay. <laughs> I only know that because I worked on those flies. Pesky things get into your grape juice. Anyway, I don't see any corrections or additions, so hearing none, I will entertain a motion from a member to accept the minutes as read. I have several. Is there a second? I have several. All members in favor? Aye. All members opposed? The minutes are unanimously accepted as read and will be posted in due course to the website. We now turn to tonight's lecture on Venus, our hot house twin. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Ellen Stofan. Ellen is the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. And she's also honorary professor at University College London, where for a time she taught. Her research focuses on the geology of Venus, Mars, Saturn's moon Titan, and Earth. Before becoming director, she served as NASA's chief scientist and principal advisor to then NASA Administrator Charles Bolden on strategic planning and programs. She played key roles in developing NASA's long range plans to get humans to Mars and strategies for NASA to support commercial activity in low Earth orbit. And she supported NASA's overall science programs in heliophysics, Earth science, planetary science, and astrophysics. Ellen also worked with President Obama's science advisor and the National Science and Technology Council on Space Policy. Before stepping into the chief scientist role at NASA, she served as vice president and senior scientist at Proxima Research, as chief scientist for the New Millennium Program at JPL, and as JPL deputy project scientist for the Magellan Mission to Venus. Ellen has published extensively on our work and is co-author of the books Planetology, Unlocking the Secrets of the Solar System, and Next Earth, What Our World Can Teach Us About Other Planets. Among many honors and awards, Ellen is the recipient of a Presidential Early Career Award and the NASA Distinguished Service Medal. And she was named one of CNN's extraordinary people of 2014. Although, needless to say, she was also extraordinary in 2019 and will be in 2020, whether CNN reports it or not. <laughs> Ellen earned her BS at the College of William and Mary and her MS and PhD in Geological Sciences at Brown. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture and join me in welcoming Helen to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. I'm, I have to keep insisting I'm actually quite ordinary, not extraordinary. Um, <laughs> so, um, tonight, what I, uh, it's, this is actually a really fun night for me because especially these days a lot, I'm talking about the museum, and so I am gonna come back around to the museum uh, right at the end of the talk. But I really have spent the bulk of my uh, long career working on the geology of Venus and trying to understand Venus. So this is actually, um, uh, actually a holiday for me to be able um, to talk about Venus because it's such an interesting planet in our solar system, and yet it is um, truly uh, been ignored, um, especially over the last 15 or so years in terms of exploration. And yet, as I hope I'm going to convince you of tonight, there are a huge number of unanswered questions about Venus that we'd like to pursue that I think have implications for not just understanding planets um, in our solar system, but for in, uh, understanding planets in general. I'd like to sort of start when I'm talking about Venus, and it's not like you all don't know that Venus is the second planet out from the sun, but just to give you this visual picture, because I think reminding us how unusual our solar system looks with these very small rocky bodies closer to the sun and the gas giants further out in the solar system. And when I was certainly in high school, college, but even when I was in graduate school, this is the solar system we had. And so a lot of our conceptions of why our solar system looked the way it did, how we understood our solar system was based on this one. 
and to some extent, that is why I'm a planetary geologist, because I always try to explain to people, when you have one thing to study, chances are that one data point often leads you down a lot of not quite so right paths. And so when we started trying to understand planets in our solar system, planetary evolution, um, I, I think we actually have been hindered um, over the years by the fact that we just had this one solar system to study. Um, and I would argue now that we're kind of almost at the very early infant stage of really getting an understanding of planets and planetary systems. Um, most of you are probably familiar with this. This is um, back in 2013, the locations of all the um, planet candidates that had found, been found by Kepler, and we're now at something like over 2,300 confirmed planets from Kepler. And most of you also probably saw the news, I think it was last week, where apparently last summer a 17-year-old intern at NASA uh, found a planet around a binary star system using test data. And so this issue of what Kepler did, I think is extremely profound. When um, Sarah Seeger had a talk that she, ga she gave that I saw fairly early on during Kepler, and she said, you know, really what Kepler has made us realize, that every star you look at up in the night sky has a planet around it, and probably not just one planet, but a planetary system. So the fact that Kepler has really sort of blown away our mind and why this image, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kepler, this is just a tiny piece of the night sky so that Kepler was looking at. Kepler basically chose one area of the sky and stared at it. So if you go outside and you put up a few fingers of your hand, you're covering about the area of the sky that Kepler found all those planets in. Really profound. And Kepler didn't find just one planet system. They found three, five, seven planet systems. So what this is telling us is that this solar system and our understanding of how it fits now that we have all these data is that we're just at the very beginning of really understanding planetary systems, how they form, how they evolve over time. Um, and so when we go to understand Venus and why Venus is significant and what Venus is telling us, I want you to always keep in your mind that we are just at the very beginning of truly having the data to put a lot of what we're learning in the proper context. So one of the reasons we've long been intrigued by Venus is because of this concept of the habitable zone. Um, so back when I was in, at, in graduate school, there was a paper written about the so-called Goldilocks zone. Why, did, why was the Earth habitable? And the idea was, and this is obviously where the Goldilocks zone came from, Venus was too hot, Mars was too cold, and the Earth obviously just right. Because Venus actually sits right at the edge, that inside edge of the habitable zone. Let me make sure I get this right. So right here, Mars is sitting uh, right outside. These planets are not supposed to represent uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So. That's an interesting concept, right? So your position away from your parent star govern, governs the ability of a planet to be habitable or not because what we are thinking about when we're thinking about habitability is the presence of liquid water on the surface. So are the conditions away from that star such on a planetary surface where you have li liquid water stable? Because for many different reasons, we think that water is significant in the evolution of life. So when we look at Venus, we thought, okay, well, it's, it's too hot, no life, only Earth, maybe Mars. But the story is always more complicated than that, right? Stories are always more complicated than that. And I think nothing to me sums up better how the situation is always more complicated than that than this slide, which was um, put together by a great scientist, uh, Don Brownlee, and I actually stole this from David Grinspoon. All of these planets are actually the Earth in one of the phases of its evolution. And so early Earth is a magma ocean. At one point, we're dominated by blue-green algae. At one point, we go into snowball Earth. At one point, we will ev evolve when the sun starts expanding to a barren desert planet. Okay, but we're still in the habitable zone, right? 
But that doesn't matter. This planet wasn't always habitable. So when we go back to this concept of the habitable zone, it's more complicated than that. What was the state of the atmosphere? What's the state of the magnetic field of a planet? There are so many factors that come into habitability that, that diagrams like this are, are, are nice and interesting, but the situation's always more complicated than that. So when we start thinking about Venus and Mars and the Earth, when we think of these planets in our solar system that are potentially habitable, we have to think of habitability as not just being a state that a planet is in and it stays there forever. Habitability can be a point in time, it can be you know, 10,000 years, it can be 10 million years, it can be three billion years. So you have to think of habitability as more than a constant state at a planet. So whether or not a planet is in a habitable zone is too simplistic of a story to really understand whether that planet is actually habitable. So when we think then, now when we go back to Venus, Earth, and Mars, you have to start thinking, okay, Venus and Mars are clearly currently mostly probably not habitable, but was that always the situation? Could there have been some time, especially earlier in their evolution, when they were habitable? And the answer for Mars is definitely yes, and the answer for Venus is maybe yes, and I'll come back to that around at the end. Now, I gratuitously stuck uh, this place in here because I really love it and I never give a talk really without talking about it. This, for those of you who don't know, this body is Saturn's moon Titan. Um, and I particularly love this image of Titan because that little bright spot that you see at the top there um, is actually specular, res, uh, uh, specular, specular, I can't talk, specular reflection off of a sea of liquid methane near the north pole of Titan and that, that specific sea is called Punga Mare. So here you have a body way out of the habitable zone, right? Way out of the habitable zone. Also a body where there's no liquid water. It's 92 degrees Kelvin on the surface of Titan. And yet, so why did I stick it when I, in this slide when I'm talking about habitability? So Titan is an amazing place because it has a full hydrologic cycle. And I know you had uh, Zibby Turtle in here uh, recently for those who managed to get to her talk on uh, Dragonfly recently. Titan is truly amazing because again, it has a complete hydrologic cycle. It rains, you have rivers that flow down into seas like the one that uh, produced that specular reflection. Uh, it evaporates back up into the atmosphere. But of course at 92, 92 degrees Kelvin, the working fluid is not water, it's actually liquid methane and liquid ethane. So when you think about planetary science and trying to go out and look at other planets, Titan is the only other body in the solar system that actually has open bodies of liquid that are interacting with the atmosphere. So incredibly uh, interesting place and incredibly interesting in this idea of habitability. Because when you go back to a couple things I said as though they were complete fact earlier, one of them was that if we're looking for life, we need liquid water. Okay, there are certainly things about water molecules that make us think they're very important for the ev evolution of life. But that is based on our one data point of where we know life evolved and the characteristics of that life, and that's Earth. Titan has a fluid, liquid methane and other liquid hydrocarbons, but it doesn't have water. The water is bound up basically as rock, um, as water ice. Uh, but do you just need a fluid? to have life. It's also very cold on Titan, and chemical reactions obviously proceed very slowly at 92 degrees Kelvin. But even if it's very cold and no water, could life evolve on Titan? So I think that Titan is an interesting counterpoint to the planets in the, out in the inner solar system to say what are the limits of life in our solar system. And this is important as we then look to those thousands of planets that have been discovered by Tep Kepler um, that are now being discovered by the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, and that the James Webb Space Telescope will then go and start studying after it launches in 2021. So I spent um, five years of my life um, working on a, on a proposal to send a boat 
to one of those seas on Titan. We were gonna land in one of the seas at the North Pole of Titan. We made it really far through the NASA process, and then we actually lost um, to a mission to Mars called InSight that's measuring quakes on, on Mars. It's a great mission. Um, but the good news, there is a happy ending to the story, um, is that I'm now actually a co-investigator on this mission, which Zibby Turtle came and talked about, called the Dragonfly mission. And this mission is gonna launch um, in 2026. It'll get to Titan in 2033. And it's really a truly amazing and fun mission. Um, and so, look it up. It's unfortunately not gonna make it to one of the seas. It's gonna be in the equatorial zone of Titan where there are sand dunes made of organic po particles, but where it does rain occasionally. So really fascinating mission, again, looking at different aspects of Titan, but also looking at this question of what are the limits of life in our solar system? How far can organic reactions proceed towards life in the absence of water and in such a cold place? Um, so a really exciting mission, but you didn't want me to come here and talk about Titan, so I'm not talking about Titan. Um, so what got me interested in Venus? So I study volcanoes across the solar system. <clears throat> and the reason we um, like to look at volcanoes, obviously, on more than one planet is volcanism is just a physical process, right? You have magma that rises. It has a certain composition. How the volcano erupts is reflective of uh, the gas in the magma, the composition of the magma, the gravity of a planet, the atmospheric pressure, the condition of the atmosphere, the temperature on the surface, all of those affect how a volcano erupts and then how far a lava flow might go away from the, from the vent it's erupting from. So that's great, right? So you say, well, we know how that works on Earth. We can go measure it. So we must be able to look at volcanoes on Mars or Venus or Io or any of the other bodies. We found volcanoes on basically every body that we've looked at in the solar system and be able to predict everything. But we can't because there's some of the physics that we don't understand or that we get a little bit wrong from our observations on Earth. So what we do is comparative um, planetology or comparative vulc volcanology where I in particular have looked at how long lava flows, very long lava flows, lava flows in excess of 20, 30, 50 kilometers long, how those get emplaced on planetary surfaces. And I'll show you some of those <coughs> in a little bit. So the volcano up in the upper right is um, Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system on Mars. Uh, in the lower left is a volcano called Mat Mons on Venus. Um, and then where you see me cringing by that um, skylight is um, in Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii. And for those of you who've never had the wonderful opportunity of standing next to an open lava flow, um, I, when I'm especially talking to kids, if you've ever like opened an oven like at Thanksgiving with the turkey's been in there for four hours and you get that blast of heat in your face, that's what it's like to stand by a vent. In fact, you stand there for like 10 seconds and then you have to run because you literally feel like you're baking. Um, so it's really quite an amazing phenomenon and really fun to throw your lunch trash in there and watch it burn. <laughs> So why is Venus so interesting? Um, and why did I say that Venus is uh, Earth's hothouse twin? Venus is very nearly the same size as the Earth, marginally smaller. Um, point, you see it's 0.94 of Earth's radius. However, the similarities, and we think the two are made because they also condensed in a relatively similar place in the solar system. They were made of probably similar uh, planetesimals impacting into each other. So you have these two bodies. They're about the same size, and for lots of geophysics and how, planetary, how planets evolve size has a lot to do with planetary evolution. Um, as a planet um, differentiates, size has a lot of, of effect made of about the same material, and yet look at the rest of these data. 243 day retrograde rota rotation. Venus rotates really, really, really slowly backwards. Um, 90 bars of pressure on the surface, 460 degrees centigrade. It is not the Earth. It's had no ocean on the surface for at least two billion years, but I'll come back to that. 
We know the composition of the surface in a couple places that it's been measured. It's fairly similar to the composition of rocks in Hawaii, so basaltic. So you have this, this um, planet that sometimes when I'm talking about it, it's like just think if you had put two chocolate cake mixes in the oven and you came back four billion years later and one cake was a chocolate cake and the other one was a lemon cake. You'd be like, what happened? Why did these two places evolve so differently? Fairly early on when I was studying Venus, because for a long time, people thought the retrograde rota rotation of Venus was likely caused by a Mars-sized body hitting Venus very early in its history, basically knocking into it and making it go backwards slowly. Um, what I loved was actually fairly early on, someone who studies solar system evolution actually did all the calculations and said, you know, Venus isn't violating anything by rotating slowly backwards. It can just do that. It's not, it didn't have to be knocked. It could have been, but we actually can't rule out that that has just always been the state of Venus. It's not violating any rules of, of physics, physics, balance of momentum in the solar system, nothing. So we don't know that that had an effect on Venus. You could say, well, Venus is closer to the sun. It should only about be about 10 degrees centigrade hotter at Venus because it's closer to the sun. The 460 degrees centigrade surface temperature is due to the fact that Venus has a runaway greenhouse atmosphere. Um, if you think of all the carbon dioxide in the Earth that's tied up in living organism, organisms, uh, marbles, limestones, all of that CO2 on Venus that on the Earth is largely captured in rock or reefs, things like that, that were uh, pulled, out by, pulled out of the atmosphere by organisms, all that CO2 on Venus is in the atmosphere. That's what gives it the runaway greenhouse atmosphere, and I'll come back to that later too. So again, from a geologist's point of view, really unclear why these two planets have such a different surface evolution. But what we do know is again, from a geologist's point of view, this is a great planet because you don't have a pesky biosphere getting in the way of the geology. You don't have this annoying ocean. You don't have annoying plants covering up the rocks and confusing you. Confusing you. Instead, you have this sort of purely geological planet, as you see in this diagram, where what happens in the interior of the planet is actually directly affecting the atmosphere without these other complicating factors like biology and ocean processes getting in the way. It's just the geology. Great planet. Gotta love it. So the exploration of Venus um, has been going on for a very long time. Uh, it was one of the early mariners flew by Venus. We, we pretty early on calculated that Venus had a very high surface temperature. But the bulk of the exploration of Venus was done by the Soviet Union. While the, the um, right away NASA sort of started focusing from the Mariner missions, yeah, we had the Mariner mission that went towards Mercury and Venus, but we had the Mariner missions to Mars. NASA really started out in kind of a survey mode. Yes, we had the human exploration to the moon, but NASA was really trying to look at what's the whole solar system like. Russia was, uh, the Soviet Union was focused on Venus. And largely, well, a lot of what we know about Venus um, and a lot of the history of the exploration of Venus really was done um, by then, them. So the picture in the um, <coughs> lower right um, is a picture taken by one of the uh, Venera landers. They had four different landers that had cameras. Uh, the landers are a whole fascinating story um, in and of themselves. The reason this looks funny is the landers were these little squat things and they had a camera that basically swung. So you went up and you can see the horizon um, up in the upper right corner there and the camera basically swung so it got this weird kind of perspective of the surface. But of all the different surfaces um, that we've seen from the Venera uh, lander images, which are still the only images we have, uh, visible wavelength images we have of the surface, um, oops. They, um, you could find analogs to them here on Earth, especially in Hawaii. So knowing that those sites from Russian, from Soviet measurements were basaltic in composition, you look at the surface, they look more or less like lava flows. Um, and so it was understood fairly early on that Venus was this 
um, obviously very hot, very sort of desolate, but mostly volcano dominated planet um, from those early missions. The atmosphere of Venus is obviously extremely dense. Um, and again, as I said, er Ooh, keep pushing the roll on. Um, and as I said earlier, is um, heavily dominated by carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide. It um, super rotates in the opposite direction of the surface. So that means the atmosphere is actually circling around the planet faster than the planet is solid surface the planet is rotating. The physics of that are very complicated. We don't totally understand it. Lots of people work on it. The processes going on in the atmosphere, I am not an atmospheric scientist. The processes going on in the atmosphere are very interesting and very complex. Um, we had uh, Pioneer Venus, an early mission that um, had some probes that went down to the surface, got some um, uh, compositional measurements as they descended through, as well as wind measurements as they descended through the atmosphere. Um, and then more recently, the Europeans have had a mission at Venus called Venus Express uh, that is focused on the atmosphere. Uh, what we're still lacking, and I'll come back to this at the end, are, are really good chemical measurements as you descend through the atmosphere, then, but especially of the atmosphere right above the surface. Um, and that's uh, important for, for a lot of different reasons. There's also a really uh, weird uh, absorber of ultraviolet light in the Venus atmosphere that we're not sure what it is. Um, so there's a lot of interest in that. I have a colleague um, named David Grinspoon that if you're interested in um, thinking about life in the clouds, he has actually suggested that the clouds in the atmosphere of Venus are actually stable. They persist for tens of thousands of years. So could that UV absorber or something else be actually some kind of microbe that lives, in a sulfur-based microbe that lives in the Venusian atmosphere? We don't know. Um, but the exploration of Venus has obviously been tough due to that very high surface temperature and pressure, but also due to the fact that as the spacecraft descends through the atmosphere, it also goes through clouds of sulfuric acid, which obviously then etch um, your spacecraft, spacecraft as it's descending through. Um, the Russian space, the Soviet spacecraft on the surface survived for um, it, over an hour, but the Soviets did it by brute force design, so they just insulated the heck out of the landers. And the landers, interestingly, uh, actually burned up from the inside out, not from the outside in, due to the heat from the electronics. Because normally when you have a spacecraft operating, right, you're gonna generate all this heat. And so they actually burned up, fact for nerds, burned up from the outside in, not the inside out. So, but as you think of future surface missions to Venus, which I'll come back to, really hard design challenge. Again, toxic atmosphere, very high pressure, very high temperature. Um, so that was basically the state of Venus exploration. So if one atmospheric mission from the US, basically Pioneer Venus, uh, several Soviet landers that measured surface composition told us it was basaltic, gave us the idea Venus is kind of a lava planet. In 1983, or actually it was 84, um, the Soviets sent two orbiters to Venus um, uh, called um, Venera 1516. Venera is um, Venus in Russian. Um, and they just numbered them one after the other. Um, so um, Venera 1516 took the first high resolution radar images of the surface, but they only imaged the northern quarter of the planet. And so I started working on that data along with ground-based uh, radar data, and I actually did my PhD thesis using the Soviet data of the northern quarter of Venus. And right about the time I was graduating from graduate school in 1989, the Magellan that NASA had put together a radar mapper mission uh, to Venus, which was the Magellan mission. Uh, I think it was launched in 89, got to Venus in 1990, um, and proceeded over its four-year life to map nearly 100% of the surface of Venus um, with a radar instrument. Again, you can't see through those clouds, so you have to use radar. Uh, at about a best sort of um, couple kilometer resolution of the surface, uh, and topography at sort of 10 to 100 kilometer resolution topography. So we also, though, did have height information of the surface. So we went from sort of four images of various spots near the equatorial zone from the Soviets, 
um, some very coarse, coarse topographic data from the Pioneer Venus mission, moderate resolution of data of the northern hemisphere to literally mapping an Earth-sized planet at, at that point, much better resolution than we had for the surface of the Earth, given that so much of the surface of the Earth um, is covered in oceans. So what did we find? So this is the Magellan topographic map. And I'll, I'll be showing you now a whole series talking about what we found with Magellan um, of radar images. And remember when you see, for those of you who aren't familiar with radar data, um, again, the topographic data is normally color-coded so that um, purples and blues are low regions and the brighter colors are high regions. Um, and in the radar data themselves, dark areas are smooth at the um, wavelength of the radar, which um, Magellan was a, gosh, 12 and a half centimeter radar, so sort of how blocky is the surface at sort of these kind of scales, that's what the radar data is telling you about. It's, it's also sensitive to the surface composition and sensitive to whether slopes are tilted towards the radar or, or away from the radar. But bulk of what you're looking at in the Mage Magellan data is how rough is the surface. And again, rough at sort of block block type scales. <clears throat> the one thing that, Ven uh, that Magellan certainly confirmed is that Venus is an incredibly volcanic planet. Basically, the entire surface is covered with some kind of volcano. So for people who like I, if you like Io, you'll, you love Venus. Um, because these are the most volcanic bodies in the solar system. Right away, before anybody gets excited and says, are any of these volcanoes erupting? We don't know. Um, because the radar data can't tell you that. And we certainly, over the course of the four-year Magellan mission, look for change. But frankly, at the scale of the radar um, that we had, you were very unlikely to have caught a change in a lava flow from a volcanic eruption. And we didn't have the ability to sense heat or anything like that, and neither has any subsequent mission. Um, so we don't know if any of these volcanoes are active, but I believe they are active. Now, obviously, belief is really not a thing in science, but um, nevertheless, I believe they are active. So, um, and I'll talk about why as we go further along. It's a scientific hypothesis. So, I'm gonna show you some of the different kinds of volcanoes on the surface, but one of the things and why I put this weird map with all these dots and triangles and everything all over it is, for those of you who are familiar with the distribution of volcanoes on the Earth. If I show you a distribution map of volcanoes on the Earth, right away you're gonna be able to see something pretty clearly. You're gonna be able to see something called the Ring of Fire, which is basically the boundaries of the Pacific Plate. So when we got these data from Magellan, these kind of maps were the one of the first things we wanted to look at. Because the first thing you're looking for is, can we use these features to test whether or not Venus has plate tectonics? Plate tectonics is what governs the geology of the Earth. It dominates how the Earth works. So here we have this planet, same size as the Earth, made of about the same stuff, which means it should have about the same amount of internal heat. Internal heat is what drives geologic processes. So shouldn't Venus have plate tectonics too? Punchline, it doesn't. And this map is one of the things that helped us understand that. Because when you look at this, you can say, I can say to you, find a pattern there. Find a plate boundary. You'll probably be able to find one, but there's not one. And that is the problem, right? As humans, you want to start drawing lines and connecting things. There's not one. Believe me, people tried. Um, so what are all these different kinds of volcanoes? And I'm, I, because I love volcanoes, um, we're gonna look at them. Um, so the two most dominant types of features that you see the largest scale um, volcanic features on the planet are large flow fields. And you can see from the scale bar, which I should have on the Im other image, that's a 100 kilometer scale bar. So when I'm talking large lava flows here, I mean large. I'm talking like a lava flow that would extend from Washington, D.C to Williamsburg, so that's a large lava flow, right? And you might be like, oh wow, that's, that's crazy. 
but it's actually not. We have lava flows that size on the Earth. They're called large igneous provinces. Um, most, some, some of you have probably heard of the Columbia River basalts. Um, they're uh, large lava flows that erupted about three million years ago, and they cover most of the state of Washington. There's one in Siberia called the Siberian Traps, a huge lava flow complex. There's one in India, the Deccan Traps, uh, and there's a large lava flow field in Australia. Now, these things are really interesting, right? Because I just gave you a whole list of ones we know of on the Earth. None of them have occurred in human history. And there's a lot of debate in the volcanological community about how they erupted. Um, did they erupt really rapidly? Did they erupt slowly? And you might say, who cares? Um, but it's actually really important because volcanic gases can have a really big effect on the atmosphere. And so if you think you're gonna have lava flows that are so big they're covering the state of Washington, whether they erupted in 100 years or 1,000 years or 3 million years, that's a huge difference in the rate of gas, like sulfur dioxide, like carbon dioxide greenhouse gases that you're introducing into the atmosphere. So the rate how these lava flows were in place actually helps us understand, for example, there's been mass extinctions that have been uh, connected to the eruption of the Siberian traps. So there's a lot of interest in how do these large lava provinces form on the Earth. Venus, no erosion, no pesky vegetation. So we can look at the pristine surfaces of these lo large lava flow fields and hopefully start to better understand how they might have formed on the Earth. You actually also see these on Mars, you see them on the Moon, you see them on Mercury. So you see these large lava flow fields in, on most bodies of the solar system, but we actually do not have a good understanding of how they formed. And there's at least um, 10 or 20 of them on Venus, so there's, there's a lot. Now, the other type of feature that you see on Venus that we also see on the Earth is hotspots. Now, most of you think, when you know about hotspots, you might think of Hawaii, sort of the one that's always described, where you have a plume of heat rising from the interior of the Earth. Um, the Pacific Plate passes over that plume of heat, and you produce a chain of volcanoes um, known as the Hawaiian Islands. Now, OK, on Mars and on Venus, which we believe both of those to be single plate planets, if you have a hotspot, but you don't have plate motion, what happens, obviously, is the volcano just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, hence Olympus Mons. On Venus, you tend to get, first of all, a topographic rise, so the surface has basically been pushed up by the heat uh, and magma being injected under the crust, but you also get on top of that volcanic rise large volcanoes like we see sitting on the Hawaiian Islands, but you also see a lot of other different volcanic types of landforms. Um, and so, on the, uh, on the slide I just showed, the white and red circles are all the different hotspots, and the number of hotspots on Earth is actually not so different from the number of hot, um, on, than the hotspots on Venus. Um, and it's also been interesting because uh, in recent years, there's been a part, and this is only something geologists probably care about, um, in recent years there's actually been a huge debate in the, in the terrestrial community about that simplistic story I just told, this plume coming from deep within the Earth and bulging, whether that actually happens or not. Because they've actually used different types of um, data, uh, especially deep seismic data, on Earth. And when they went to look for the plume, like underneath some of these places like Hawaii, it wasn't there, um, and underneath Iceland. So the story of how hotspots form on the Earth has gotten much more complicated. Um, some of the scientific community has wanted to do away with the theory altogether and say it's all due to plate tectonics. It has nothing to do with these plumes. And it was interesting because we were at a conference where this was being hugely argued and I'm like, oh, okay, but we have them on Venus, so there's no plate tectonics, so explain me that. So it's really interesting. And so here's an area where Venus is actually, I think, helping to inform the debate on Earth. Two other types of volcanic features um, that dominate the surface, um, volcanoes of all sorts. If you like weird shaped volcanoes, Venus is the place to go. We have volcanoes shaped like ticks. We have volcanoes shaped like pancakes. Um, we have fields of little volcanic shields. Um, and by little, Venus kind of throws your brain off because a lot of those these little tiny um, shields you see in this image, uh, 
uh, here. Um, these are 10 to 15 kilometers across, which is not that difference in size than say Mount Etna and Sicily. So if you think of 20 or 30 Mount Etnas all next to each other erupting at the same time, that's crazy. So these little volcanic fields are actually quite, quite impressive. Um, the other type of, oh, and it ha we have very large volcanoes. This volcano is called um, Kunapipi Mons. Um, we could go on and on, I could go on and on. I'm on the um, International Astronomical Union Commission on Venus Nomenclature. Um, things on Venus are named after women, um, and the volcanoes are all named after um, different uh, goddesses. Uh, and they, they make a big effort to make sure that they're balanced from cultures all around the world, that they're not, nothing's named after um, living figures. It's very complicated, there's all these rules. Um, so anyway, this is an interesting volcano because it actually has um, a double summit. Um, and I was just a few weeks ago at Kilimanjaro, which actually also has kind of a double summit cone. So we were actually looking at Kilimanjaro at one point in comparison uh, to this volcano on Venus. This volcano is about 250 kilometers across. So quite a large volcano, but it's only about six kilometers high. So think of volcanoes on Venus, really easy to climb to the top, just takes you because it's really long, but very, very low slopes, which suggests quite viscous or thin lava uh, flows coming out of it. A type of feature on Venus um, that appears to be more or less uh, unique to Venus, though there's an analog on, on one of Neptune's moons, are features called corona. They were named um, by the Soviets who first saw them in the Venera 1516 data. Uh, they range in size from about 80 kilometers across to over uh, 1,500 kilometers across. Um, they're called corona because they tend to have this ring of fractures surrounding them. And you might say, are they holes or do they stick up like, like plateaus or domes? And the answer is yes. Um, some of them are holes for, and some of them are plateaus, some are domes, and for example, this feature is actually quite complicated. Um, the center rises, but these things are actually in waves, so it's quite a complicated feature. And these were discovered right around the time I was doing my PhD thesis, um, so I got to write kind of one of the original description papers of it, which was just being in the right place um, at the right time. But they're really fascinating features, and again, no great analog um, on other planets, but we think they're called they're caused by, if you think of hot spots as being from a major plume rising from the interior of the planet, um, corona we think are formed by sort of a higher level instability in the mantle um, that, that comes up and sort of pushes up the surface. Um, but on Venus, the rocks are so hot that the feature over time starts to sag. And in some cases, material descends and you actually pull the, the feature back down again. Um, so complicated formation. Um, corona are particularly interesting to me because obviously as I showed you earlier on that distribution map, you don't tend to just look at a feature in isolation, you want to look at it around other features of its type and say, well, what kind of setting does it occur in? And in a couple places on Venus, the corona actually, the, they actually occur in chains. This image is over 2,000 kilometers across, so this is actually a huge re region. Each of these individual features are somewhere between 100 and 300 kilometers across. Most of these are all plateaus, and this is a hot spot rise. So this feature in here is raised. This is actually a rift system coming down through here. The rift cuts across the volcanic rise. Um, and I and a student, actually now probably two or three students, have spent years measuring everything, comparing everything, looking at the topographic data, measuring the fractures, trying to figure out, can we even figure out simple things like the timing of the onset of the fracturing versus the topographic activity versus the volcanism, trying to get at the sequence of how this region formed. And in general, it's really confusing, that I can promise you. Um, very, very complicated um, place, very difficult to unravel the history of it. And you might say, why is it so tough to unravel the history of this? On planetary surfaces, when we try to understand what happened when, we use impact craters, especially on Mars, on the Moon, and even to some extent, we see this on Earth. The older a surface, planetary surfaces, 
the more time it's had to be impacted by asteroids or comets coming out, so the more impact craters it has on it. So for example, when people make geologic maps of sections of Mars, they have a section that has lots of craters, and they can say, oh, well, that's the Noachian because it has this many craters on it. And this, well, this is a different age. It's the Hesperian because it has this many craters on it. In this entire area, which is actually over 3,500 by 3,500 kilometers, I think there's four impact craters in the whole image. And I'll come back to that later. Very few impact craters on Venus. What that tells us is this is young. By geologic standards, extremely young. Compared to the surface of Mars, very young. So okay, now we're back to my belief, right? Is this area volcanically active? Probably. But I don't have proof, so I don't know. What I do know, and I should have uh, just flung this slide up earlier, but all these data you see here, that's just the topography superimposed. So just showing you, we can use multiple data sets. We don't just have the radar images. We also have topographic information that we can use to try to apply some physical models and try to understand how these features formed. I mean, we do, we have finite element code models. We have um, heat that comes up from the interior, pushes up the surface to try to see how accurately we can model, predict how thick the layers are models like that. In this, um, this, uh, this, whew, wow, I'm pathetic at this. Um, this image here is actually this volcano uh, right here. It's a feature called Chloris Mons. And this red data that you see superimposed on top of uh, what is actually a, a geologic map, sorry. Uh, you can see I'm directionally challenged. On top of this geologic map, that red data came from an in instrument on the Venus Express mission called VIRTUS. It's a Venus infrared thermal mapper. So what it's doing is it's actually collecting th um, infrared emissions from the surface of Venus through the atmosphere. So it was an um, atmosphere or an instrument that um, it was a largely German team put on the Venus Express mission. And they had to do a lot of processing to try to subtract out um, the atmosphere that's between the spacecraft that was in orbit around Venus and the surface. But when they subtracted all that out, they got this signature of high infrared signature on the, on the tops of a couple different volcanoes in this region, which is called Themis Regio. And based on modeling by the folks who uh, are using that instrument, they they think that over time, rocks on Venus actually interact with the atmosphere. If they have iron in them over time, the emissivity signature kind of gets smeared out to a Venus average. So the fact that these volcanoes at their summits, which appear to be the youngest parts based on geologic mapping, have this signature, suggests that the rocks in those areas are relatively young with relatively, they think, based on the modeling of what they've been doing of the surface chemical processes, means within the last million years. Now for a geologist, that's like wacky, incredibly young. Some of you might think a million years, but it's either a million years or younger. So to be able to narrow it down even to that much suggests that these regions could actually still be volcanically active. And that's important because back to this question of why doesn't Venus have plate tectonics? Why is it so different than the Earth? Whether or not it's still volcanically active actually helps us to try to understand the evolution of the planet better. Now, for all that I said that the planet doesn't have plate tectonics, it's got some weird things that many scientists have suggested could have been indicative of plate tectonics very early in its history. Um, these two, this is a topographic image. This is the same area in radar in this ridge system you're seeing right here. Uh, man. The ridge system you see in the radar image is the same ridge system you see right here. This is the highest point on Venus, a mountain range called Maxwell Montes. Um, it's the only feature on Venus named after a man, um, James Clerk Maxwell, um, because of course he's the originator of the radar equation, or sorry, not the radar equation, it's in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so. This area, Ishtar Terra, of where, which Maxwell Montes is a part, is a really unusual area. You have this very, very steep um, mountain ridge, a high plateau, 
um, that in many people's minds remind you of, say, something like the Tibetan Plateau, um, features that are indicative of plate tectonics on the Earth. So could Ishtar Terra be the remnant of ancient plate tectonics on Venus? We don't know, but if you certainly wanted to go somewhere that might preserve older rocks on Venus, this is a place you might go. And you might ask, does it have a different impact crater density? No. It still, it still looks relatively young based on impact craters. This is another feature that's actually in the southern hemisphere of the planet. Um, this feature is over 2,600 kilometers across. It sort of looks like a corona, but frankly, the next smallest corona is 1,500 kilometers across. So this is off-scale bigger. This is an extremely deep trench um, that has morphology very reminiscent of um, trenches like the Marianas Trench on Earth, similar curvature that might lead you to think that it is perhaps an abandoned subduction zone on Venus. So we have these weird indications in a very few places that maybe very early in its history, Venus had plate tectonics, but that it stopped. Now, one of the things that drives plate tectonics on the Earth is something called trench pull. So the plates are going into the trenches, and that actually exerts quite a force. The reason plates go into trenches and subduct is because you have water being subducted along with the rock, and the water actually alters the, the temperature and makes it easier to subduct. Now, Venus obviously has no water. Um, and we think it ha it's actually lacking a layer in the interior of the planet called an asthenosphere that actually we all th also think uh, contributes to plate tectonics. So for all those reasons, okay, Venus doesn't have plate tectonics, but what if it had an ocean early in its history? So the fact that we see features that could be ancient subduction zones on Venus, could they be indicating that at some point earlier in its history it did have an ocean, it did have plate tectonics? Um, and there's actually atmospheric isotopic data that seems to suggest the same thing, that Venus at some point had an ocean's worth of water on its surface, which was subsequently lost, probably largely stripped by the solar wind, and of course evaporated as Venus got hotter and hotter. Venus also has some super unusual terrain on the surface that are called tessera. Um, they're highland plateaus that tend to be sort of five to seven kilometers above the surface. Um, they're very, I don't have a better word for it, rumpled. Um, so the topography is sort of plateau-like, but, but irregular. And the surfaces are highly, highly deformed. Um, if you look up in close, this is just a, a section of the tessera. And you see fractures going in many different directions. We see compressional features. We see extensional features. But the problem with Venus is, remember that when you're looking at a surface on Venus, there has been almost no erosion. So a surface like this, where you see all this complexity of fracturing, you tend to start wanting to pull out stress directions and saying, all right, I've got extension in this direction, and so the crust was pulling that way and it was compressing this way. But without erosion, we have no idea if these things happened at the same time, tens of millions apart, or hundreds of millions apart. And so everyone's initial, when we started analyzing this data, is you take this and, oh my gosh, all this happened at once. How, I have to come up with some model that produces all of these things all at the same time. But you have to be really careful. Venus is really difficult. Because as I used to say, and this is how long I've been working on these data, it's like a video, it's like a VCR tape where you have like four movies on top of each other and you're trying to figure out the plot of one of them. That used to work, it doesn't work anymore. No one knows what a VCR tape is. And the concept of taping on top of each other, also gone, very interesting. I don't think I'm that old, but I am. Um, so really complicated, but really interesting. What does this mean? One of the things is, in the emissivity data I was talking about, these areas actually show up as anomalous. And they, they look anomalous in an indication that they more, may be more silica-rich than other re regions on the planet. So that's led some people to suggest that they could be analogous to continents on the Earth, so they could be more granitic. We think you need water to form granites, so a lot of mission proposals to Venus have suggested going to the tessera and sampling the rock to see if it's granitic, because that would help us understand the history of water on the planet, what role water played, how much was there, how long did it persist. 
You can get that from both some atmospheric isotopic data that we could get at the surface, as well as rock composition. The problem is, these are the roughest areas on Venus. So when you're trying to convince NASA that you want to land in the roughest place on Venus where they say, well, how, how steep are the slopes? And you go, well, we don't quite know. Probably steep. That's not a good answer. So these are really tough places. But actually, um, I will say, um, the folks at Goddard Space Flight Center a couple years ago did a mission concept design for going to the Tessera that was just brilliant. It was a really cool lander that could kind of roll once it got there. And it was, it was a great concept. It hasn't been flown. So I've mentioned impact craters. So there are impact craters on the surface of Venus. And these are um, a few of my favorite craters. Um, this is one that obviously sits uh, along a rift zone. So you can see part of the rim of the crater here, the rest of the crater here. And it's actually been split apart um, by this rift. So really awesome. You can do all kinds of nice stress equations and figure out exactly how far it got split, what kind of force that means. Really fun stuff. And here's uh, another crater that's been partially covered by a lava flow. So you can say, OK, the crater was there, and then the lava flow formed on top of it. And I just put this one in because um, it looks like a little fish. Um, but it's also to point out the very freshest craters on Venus. Remember, I've already talked. It's so hard to date things on Venus. We can't figure out how old anything is. This crater, actually, look at this weird halo it has around. around. Uh, so a, a small number of craters on Venus have this halo which we actually think is an area that's basically been blasted by the atmospheric blast as the crater impacted on the surface. Remember, Venus has this very dense atmosphere, and so some pretty smart people figured out the force from the impact of the atmosphere hitting the surface would actually sort of scour out a zone, um, and this actually fits the model of, of what the blast of the atmosphere would do. It also tells you which direction the impactor came in from. Um, so these features are really young, probably within the last few million years. So that's a little bit of data information. And sometimes these halos extend over regions so you can get some indication. Nothing is younger than these halos that we found. They seem to be the youngest features, but they don't touch a lot of things. These two uh, impact craters are among the most unusual impact craters on Venus because they have been affected by geologic activity. I can say, the crater was there, it got rifted apart. The crater was there, the lava flow. So I can get a temporal uh, list of things that happen, which geologists like to do to try to understand the history of a planet. Remember how I said there were so few impact craters that we can't do normal age dating of planetary surfaces the way we do on every other body in the solar system. This is a map of the location of um, all of the locations of impact craters on Venus that was put together by folks at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And you can see there, there aren't that many craters. And it turns out if you do a density where you figure out how many craters there are, the size distribution of them, the number of impactors that we think would be passing through that part of the solar system, you actually get an average crater retention age of the surface of about 750 million years, which tells us the surfaces we're looking at are somewhere between recent and about a billion years. So Venus' surface is very young. Mars' surface, several billion years old. Venus, young. But the problem is the impact crater population can't be distinguished from a random population. Which means that even in this area, if I say, well, wow, it looks like there's a lot more craters in this area, because the crater population can't be distinguished from a random population, even when there seems to be a clustering of craters, you actually can't extract meaning from it. So we are really left on Venus with no ability to age date surfaces. So when I do what geologists do, which is make maps, we like to make maps, and why we make maps is we're trying to get this sequence of events. What happened first? Because if I have a sequence of events, I can start putting models and saying, what happened over geologic history on this planet? How can then I compare that to models of planetary evolution and try to understand what was going on in the interior of the planet? The problem is I have no ability to know if this, this stuff all happened within the last 10 million years or billion years. No ability, and that really hinders our ability to understand Venus. So it has actually led to uh, 
sort of two dominant theories for Venus. One is that, um, let me actually, I'm gonna hold that, let me just go. This is just a side slide, sorry, off topic. But I just wanted to show you that the data, for all that I just said, wow, these data are hopeless, you know, we're really stuck, we can't extract information. There are some fun things we can do to help understand what I was talking about either. H how do volcanoes work? How can we use volcanoes on different planets? And this is just to show a study that I did um, with Lori Glaze, a woman who's at NASA headquarters, um, but she was at, at Goddard Space Flight Center. And we were actually looking at this particular Vena, uh, volcano on Venus called Sifmons. All these little black dots you see around the volcano are what are called subsidiary vents. So volcanoes both erupt from the main caldera at the top of the volcano, but as you can see from these lava flows here and here, they also erupt from what are called flank vents or sort of secondary vents. And if you can map that out, you can start thinking about what is the structure underneath the volcano, where are there dikes or paths for lava to be coming up, how did the volcano arrive, uh, evolve, can I find flows that are younger and older, and it's something we call the plumbing, literally the plumbing of the volcano. And can I then compare the plumbing of, of volcanoes on Venus to volcanoes on the Earth and start to get at how does this volcano actually work in a physical sense. So we did this for some volcanoes on Venus and then we actually did it because we had some really nice radar data over Mount Etna in Sicily and I've done a lot of field work there. But the amusing thing is, keep in mind, um, this volcano is 300 kilometers across and the diameter of Mount Etna in Sicily, which when you're there seems like a really big volcano, is about 40 kilometers. But you can see it also has these patterns of subsidiary vents, um, and so we did some detailed comparisons of what that might imply about the um, plumbing and the evolution of these large volcanoes. So just to show you, even if in the larger sense we're often confused about Venus, we can still as extract a lot of useful information out of the Magellan data. But as the chain, chain of thought I was about to go on. So, okay, we have this planet now that we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand its evolution, compare it to the Earth, and, and really get at why is Venus so different than the Earth? How did it evolve over its history? And how can we use that information to better understand how Earth-like planets evolve? But without impact craters, without this age-dating information, two, these two dominant theories that I mentioned have evolved. One of them, is that everything we're seeing on Venus happened about 750 million years ago. That there was a catastrophic overturn of the interior of Venus that caused basically massive floods of lava to come out across the surface that catastrophically resurfaced it. And ever since that 750 million years ago, Venus has been sitting there not doing anything. So this very catastrophist vision of Venus. I, I don't sign up for that. So, um, and then another portion of the community, of which I'm part of, says, uh, not so fast. You know, there's a lot of indications that volcanoes have been erupting from a billion years ago or so up to most recent. Um, and, and the problem is, all we have is pretty much summarized in this slide. We know very early you had some tessera. And then you had lava plains, you had a few craters, but not many, and they got mostly covered up and they're gone, and you've got some younger lava flows, but not a lot. And the problem is I can fit lots of different models to this. I can actually fit a slower evolving model. I can fit a catastrophic model. But the truth is, even though I'm in one of those camps, we honestly don't know. We don't know if Venus was this catastrophic planet. We don't know. What we need to figure that out is more data. We need data the isotopic composition of the atmosphere. We need data the composition of the rocks, especially trying to tease out the history of volatiles, particularly water on the planet. And then we could start to differentiate between those two theories. But right now, we just have a bunch of scientists who argue with not enough data. So if you think of, again, how the Earth works, with this system of plate tectonics that we understand very well, this layered planet, these occasional hot spots producing things like the Hawaiian Islands, hot spots supposedly underlies Africa. This is a system we know well. We want Venus to be the same thing, but it's not. Instead, we have a single plate planet 
that seems to have some blobs rising up and maybe they form these corona for reasons we don't understand. What we do know is that the lack of an ocean on Venus is clearly playing a lot in what's happening on Venus or what's not happening on Venus right now. We know that the data that has been collected by both the Venus Express and the Pioneer Venus mission did suggest that Venus had an ocean's worth of water that was lost, and there's some scientists that have suggested Venus's ocean could have persisted for over a billion years, which is enough time for life to have evolved. But we, we don't know, and again, we need to get down to the surface. And then there's the whole issue of Venus's greenhouse. So when did exactly the greenhouse evolve? Again, maybe it's three billion years old, maybe it's older. It certainly wasn't caused by Venusians um, driving, um, you know, putting hydrocarbons in. Nevertheless, Venus certainly serves as an inter interesting counterpoint when we think of climate change here on the Earth. This is um, uh, some models uh, that have been put together um, by NASA um, called the GDDP, or Global Daily Downscaled Projections. Um, this is using something called RCP 8.5, which comes out of the, um, uh, the Global Climate Group. The, that scenario is kind of the, what we call the business as usual scenario. So it's everybody's just gonna keep burning hydrocarbons and putting it in the air. This is what the planet would look like in July of 2099. There are certainly error bars on this, but the basic message is the planet is very hot, and in fact, remember that um, a lot of photosynthesis seizes around 90-some degrees, um, so this is not good for feeding the world when you have temperatures this hot. So comparative climatology has helped inform our understanding of the atmosphere and the evolution of climates on other planets, but certainly looking at other planets has also helped inform our understanding of the Earth. And I was actually um, at a comparative climatology meeting a couple years ago, and there were people in the audience that were really angrily arguing, and you st I still saw, I saw somebody tweeted about this the other day, there's a big, Venus can't, or, or the Earth can't become Venus. Um, you can't have a runaway greenhouse on Earth. And indeed, people have run out the models. If we put all the hydrocarbons um, in the atmosphere, and so they're talking, they're arguing about this at this meeting. If you put all the hydrocarbons in, on Earth, so you burn all the shale oil, you burn all the oil, you burn all the coal, um, we still wouldn't get to a runaway state the way Venus is, where it's 460 degrees centigrade. They said you'd still have little tiny bits of the oceans left. You wouldn't completely burn off um, the oceans. You'd have this little area, and, and you were like, yeah, the Earth would cease to have been habitable long before that. And I'm like, oh, okay, why are we, are, I mean, li literally people get heated about this. V Earth is not gonna run away. Yeah, oh yeah, all life will cease to exist on Earth, but it won't be a runaway greenhouse. I'm like, well, I'm glad we have that cleared up. Um, so Venus, Earth can't get to the state of Venus, but we don't wanna push it, right? Um, and we don't wanna get to that point. We know where it goes. Um, there are things about Venus's atmosphere that we are actually helpful in understanding climate. Venus has aerosols in its atmosphere, little particles that help regulate the climate on Venus, that Venus would be a good place to go. The role of clouds in, in Venus's climate would be particularly interesting from a comparative climatology point of view. So there's reasons we'd like to go study Venus, not just from this whole surface evolution, habitability, kind of how many Earths are out there, can we figure that out by looking at our failed attempt in our solar system that didn't quite make it to the Earth. But on a climate point of view, I think there are other also really interesting and compelling uh, reasons to go to Venus. And in fact, one of the reasons we found the ozone hole um, here on Earth um, was from some early work that Jim Hansen was doing um, at Venus. So, Again, when you pull back to this point and you say, are you at Venus? Maybe it was habitable in its first billion years. Maybe it did have that ocean. Maybe life could have evolved. Maybe it migrated into the atmosphere. Maybe it never made it. Maybe life never evolved at all. We don't know. But clearly Venus is an example of a planet that was on a path potentially to habitability but it didn't get there. Why? Maybe it was just that Goldilocks thing. Maybe that 10 degrees centigrade, the changing evolution of the sun, maybe that was enough to push it out of the habitable range. Earth, just right, right? Good, we're great, except we're kind of pushing it out of the habitability range. 
Mars, too cold, right? We know that Mars had persistent oceans on its surface early in its history, then clearly evolved out of habitability. And finally, Titan, a really good analog for trying to understand the limits of life in our solar system. But the most exciting thing for me is as we're trying to answer these questions in our own solar system, we're looking at new solar systems. The James Webb will be telling us about the atmospheres of planets around other stars. We all have ground-based telescopes that are probing the atmospheres of planets around other world stars. So all of a sudden, we're gonna be able to put our solar system, this question of how many chances did life have in our solar system, which ones won, which ones lost, what was the time frame they did it in, we need that information to help us as we start going beyond our own solar system. We have an incredible experiment in our solar system that informs us as we look outward, and that look out outward will help inform our understanding of our own solar system. And in two years, in January of 2022, we will open a new gallery um, called Exploring the Planets um, in the National Air and Space Museum, which will be a totally updated um, gallery on planetary science. And I urge you all in January of 22 to come visit us at the Air and Space Museum. Thank you. some questions, and we have a procedure for the questions. So keep your hand up, and eventually a microphone will come to you that will have a colored foam covering, and I will call on you by the color of the foam covering. I'll go in order. I think we have a red, a blue, a blue, a red, and a black. So we'll start with Bob Terry in the blue microphone. Please stand up, tell us your name, tell us if you're a member, and ask a question, save the speeches for the social hour. You saved me most of the trouble. I'm Bob. And I'm keep the microphone very close to your mouth. And this retrograde motion against the atmosphere, has anyone thought about whether Venus is trying to slowly become tidally locked? And is this part of the dynamic that might be going on there? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't do planetary dynamics. Somebody else in the audience might know the answer to that. Sorry. Red microphone. Yeah, uh, I'm Joe Powers. I'm I'm not a member. Uh, in in your talk, you mentioned that Earth and Venus had similar amounts of geological heating, but Earth has the friction left over from the impact of the Moon, and and I had thought that the amount of heat in the core of the Earth due to that versus the radioisotopes was was unknown. We only knew the total heat at Earth. So so has that changed, or is that just a how does that well, how, 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 how do you infer that Venus has as much heat as the Earth has, despite uh, being small? Well, because most of the heat from those events is thought to have largely dissipated, though you're right. I mean, there's not 100% knowledge of it. And that there's a general feeling, and there is kind of a, a heat balance, that the bulk of the heat that's driving plate tectonics does come from the decay of radioactive elements, um, uranium, um, um, thorium, and plutonium. So potassium, sorry, not plutonium. Potassium. So um, Venus should have about the same amount of radioisotopes. Again, the two planets condensed from very similar, but small differences in that could make a big difference in the heat. So that's what we don't know either. And years ago, um, Sean Solomon and Jim Head wrote a paper about trying to understand heat on Venus and the heat on the terrestrial planets in general. Um, it's a great paper, it, it stands the test of time, it was written in the 1980s, but a really good look at sort of the heat balance and what drives geological processes, and that still pretty much governs people thinking. But small differences can make big differences, so we don't, you're not totally wrong, basically. We don't totally know. I mean, face it, look at Pluto. It shouldn't have as much geologic activity as it does, and it does, so, all right, figure that out. Black microphone. Oh, yes, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is David Lewis. Uh, I'm a member. Uh, you talk quite a bit about the role of uh, plumes of heat coming from the interior of Venus and impacting uh, the surface. Uh, could you speak a little bit maybe about how the dynamics of that works and uh, also are the uh, distribution of those plumes comparable to what we see on Earth? They are. And 
there's loads and loads and loads of literature about this, and um, I have a geophysicist friend, um, Seuss McCarr, that does um, all my modeling, so I'm not a geophysical modeler, but um, they're regarded as largely being sort of Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, and convective systems have these instabilities that form in them, and they're pretty well modeled for the Earth, um, similar for Venus, and so the fact that Venus Again, this is one of those questions that gets back to why do we think Venus and the Earth should have about the same amount of heat? They seem to have about the same number of plumes. Um, the plumes seem kind of similar in scale, um, but again, their instabilities in convective systems, they're predicted, they're, they're pretty, well, they're well modeled. I, I had actually a geophysicist once at a conference stand up when I was talking about something about corona, and I was saying something and he goes, well, that has to be the right theory because I can model it. And you're like, huh, okay. We have a blue microphone, then red, then black. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. I was looking at your world temperature map for 2099, and it looks about 30 degrees Fahrenheit too hot, and I wonder where the data came from. So again, that's um, uh, based on what are called the CMIP models. So they're climate models that are based on the taking all the, the climate models um, that you know, there's a bunch of about five or six climate models, Europe, the folks in, at NCAR, so there's all these different climate models. So they've come together and they sort of have a, a different versions where they say, how do we put all of our climate models together and get a roughly good, uh, good agreement? Then they ran them out with different, the RCPs are different, um, uh, I can't remember what RCP stands for, somebody in the audience probably knows, but those are scenarios that were defined um, by the um, IPCC, and 8.5 is just what is usually called the business as usual, so those are, it's just a model, and those data can be downloaded, again, it's called the GDDP, or the Global Daily Downscaled Projections, it's a NASA website, um, and that's an image from it. They were released in 2015 or 2014 by NASA. Red microphone. Kirby Runyon, Johns Hopkins APL, I am a member. Um, thinking about the future exploration of Venus, the ignored planet, what would be your favorite type of mission? Would it be orbital, surface, atmospheric, geomorphology, composition, geophysical, all that? So if it was purely um, selfish for my own research, I would definitely say an orbital mission because higher resolution, you always want higher resolution topography and higher resolution imaging data. Um, but I actually think we could get some almost yes, no answers, for example, with a, um, a lander mission that would really get at much higher resolution isotopic data of the atmosphere, be able to measure some isotopic systems that we haven't looked at before, better measurements especially of xenon, krypton in the atmosphere, um, and getting some data on the surface rocks. If we could get this, are there minerals that would indicate there had been water on the surface, so the mineralogy of the surface rocks? And there's a couple places we could go. We could go to the top of one of these volcanoes that we think has potentially erupted, and of course we could go to the tessera. Um, the problem I think with the tessera is if they're really parts of the crust that have been upthrusted and shuffled around, we may analyze the wrong rock. Um, so it's problematic, but I'm usually a lander. I've been involved in both lander mission proposals to the surf, surface atmospheric, and Venus missions keep getting proposed to NASA and proposed to NASA and proposed to NASA, just none of them have been selected. Um, but uh, the Venus community is kind of a never give up kind of community, um, never surrender. So we're just gonna keep fighting, and I'm hoping with this next round of NASA mission proposals that we'll see some new Venus missions and we're really hopeful that one of them will get selected because Venus has so much to tell us and there's so much left to measure. Black microphone. Um, will Angel, I am a member. For the isotopic studies that you'd like to see of the atmosphere, what, what sort of inferences about age and active volcanism would that allow you to make? Um, and again, this is not my area. I'm not an atmospheric scientist, but um, <laughs> I have friends who are atmospheric scientists. So there's definitely a whole series of systematics, like I was saying, if you, if you look at the noble gases, um, you can really start looking at how is the atmosphere, how is the planet outgassed over time. Um, so there's a number of different noble gases that I know the atmospheric scientists are particularly keen. Obviously, looking at the deuterium 
Um, to hydrogen ratio is another one that we've looked at before, but we'd like to measure it again at much higher precision. So um, as I said, there's a couple different ones we'd like to look at the oxygen better. So um, there, there's a whole list and it's not technologically difficult. The problem is on the surface of Venus, as we talked about, you don't have very long to do it, but you could get it done in the amount of time you would live. And frankly, that is part of the problem with a Venus mission because you're gonna say, we're gonna spend a lot of money to send a mission to the Venus surface and it's gonna live for an hour. <laughs> and that's a tough sell, right? But in that hour, it is gonna return yes, no answers to questions that we have about Venus, which I would argue you could have missions that last for years and give you a lot of like, eh, maybe. And, and, and so it's a hugely valuable mission. But sometimes when you get to the point of how do you sell a mission, it, it gets more difficult, especially because it's, re it's really hot. And we've looked at, for those who are interested in the engineering of it, we've, there's just not a lot of work. There's high temperature sensors for things like, you know, measuring things inside of aircraft engines, but there's not high temperature electronics in the sense of, of systems like a computer, a transmitter that can survive at those high temperatures. Blue microphone. Uh, hi, Carl Merrill, I'm a member. Um, you, early in your presentation, you talked about Titan and you concentrated on the methane, but doesn't Titan have fairly large bodies of subterranean water that might be salty that uh, also might be exciting? Um, it, it does. So Venus, like, uh, sorry, um, Titan, like um, many of the icy satellites in the outer solar system, has a water ice crust, but at some level below the water ice crust, you have liquid water. So that's true at Europa, it's true at Enceladus, um, and it's likely true at Titan. The problem is at Titan, that water doesn't seem to be accessing the surface at all. So there doesn't seem to be any pathways for it to come up, except for the occasional cryovolcano. So Dragonfly is gonna go to an impact crater where, for example, at the time the impact crater, it might have punched either into that or, or allowed, fractured the surface and allowed some of that icy water. So that's why Dragonfly is very excited to be um, near the end of its mission. It'll be going to an impact crater for that, for that very reason. Enceladus and Europa are kind of the sexy targets because they spit their subsurface water oceans out and you can go access them much more easily. Titans is more inaccessible. Red microphone. Elise Wynn, guest of a member. Um, your point up there about how atypical our uh, solar system seems to be now. We have no super Earth, we have no mini Neptunes. The concept of migrating giant planets. Um, what about the concept that the terrestrial planets were actually second generation that formed after the migrations? I, I think that is super interesting. There's so much that we don't know um, at this point. Um, we never thought about, I mean, certainly people came up with ideas like migrating planets, but they were never taken seriously until we started getting all the extrasolar da data. And what I think is the most f fascinating and why I kind of said we're in our infancy right now is right now we're starting to have data on a lot of solar systems that don't seem to look very much like ours at all. So we don't know what's typical. We haven't looked at enough. And I think between TESS, James Webb, these Earth-based telescopes, the more data we're start, we start gathering, how, how are we gonna find another solar system that looks like ours, or are we really atypical? Right now, I would argue, we, we, have, we now see how little we know um, about solar system evolution because all the ones we see look so different from us. Um, and I think it's fascinating, and it just means that the curve of, of what we're gonna learn, especially over the next 20 years, I think is mind blowing. Um, and I always tell to, try to tell kids that, you know, cause I do think, you know, sometimes people feel like science is this thing that happened in the past. And you're like, science is happening right now. And we don't know where it's gonna go. It's so exciting. So the next is black, then blue, then red. Hi, Jim Rice, I'm not a member. Uh, you had a slide earlier that showed the comparison of the internal structure of Earth and Venus. And it's very similar. Uh, it, Earth has a magnetic field, it has a core dynamo. Uh, given that the only difference is that Venus doesn't have an asthenosphere, why doesn't it have it a, a core dynamo and a magnetic field? It would seem to explain a lot. We don't know. <laughs> no, and I, I should have mentioned that. Venus does not have a magnetic field. 
we don't know if it used to have one and it now has one. It, 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 did it have one in the past and now it doesn't? Because, for example, now we have information that Mars probably had a magnetic field early in its history. Um, uh, there are people like Vicki Meadows who are looking at you know paths to habitability. Magnetic fields clearly play some kind of role in that. Um, and, and so this issue of whether Venus ever had a magnetic field, why doesn't it have one now? Um, is that fact telling us something back to this heat question? How much, you know, how much heat is the interior of Venus really generating if the core is not actually active? So there's huge questions about this. And so very early in my career, um, I spent um, some time working on um, mission proposals to send a seismometer network to Venus because the way we really understand the interior structure of a planet is obviously through seismic data and through very large earthquakes, especially if it's over like a six or a seven, the whole planet um, wiggles and so you can get really deep interior structure from that. Um, but you can imagine Venus, you have to have a seismometer live for a year, so we had crazy like nuclear powered refrigerators to, um, to keep it cool. It's a great mission concept. Um, but people still look at that because that's the kind of data you actually need. To, these, some of these big questions about why is Venus so different, you need seismic data to really get at that. There's some issues of maybe you could look at the atmosphere and get seismic and interior structure. People do it with the Earth, um, with watching the atmosphere um, wiggle when a big earthquake occurs. But we know a lot about the Earth, so we can interpret the wiggles we see, basically. So I'm skeptical about learning about Venus that way. But people have suggested that. Blue microphone, then the red one. Hi, I'm Mia. I'm not a member, but I'm actually coming from American University's new Emerging Space Club. And I had a question for you. Seeing that you've studied so much uh, of Venus, I was wondering, from a more business and policy side, what is the current private sector interest in Venus like, seeing that there's a lot in Mars? and what do you think it's going to look like in the future as we learn more about Venus? You know, so far I would characterize it as pretty much zero. Um, and, and the part of the reason is Venus is so hard. Mm -hmm. And again, like I, I used to, when I, I worked at JPL and over the years, um, and I worked, um, one of the reasons I worked on this new millennium program at JPL was this technology push. Like how can we really start pushing technology? Because I was so frustrated with trying to explore Venus. Because if we had things like high temperature components, we'd be able to really explore Venus in a way that we just can't. So we're technology limited, though there's still a lot we can do with conventional technology, which is all these mission proposals. Um, and so because Venus is so hard and the commercial sector doesn't see an application, we can't even get them to invest in things like high temperature components. Again, little sensors, little bits of high temperature work. But, but not a lot of success. So that, that's been frustrating. Um, people have, have looked at and are continuing to look at concepts of sending humans um, to orbit Venus and maybe teleoperate rovers on the surface, maybe investigate this, the clouds and potential weirdness there, because it's a lot easier to get humans to Venus and back in a short amount of time. Um, and so it's actually a feasible human mission. So people have tossed it around, but it's not been looked at that seriously yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Red microphone. Adam Jacobson, I'm a member. You mentioned that Venus and another solar system body, which I'm blanking on right now, has just one tectonic plate. Mars. Mars, thank you. Is, are there theories about whether it was always that way or at some point in the past it had multiple plates and then something changed? Um, for both Mars and Venus, um, there's a suggestion that they had multiple plates at some point in their history. Um, for Mars, because of this limited um, magnetic data that was, that was discovered, seemed to indicate um, that there could have potentially been some plates on Mars very early in its history, um, but that is certainly still an open question and I think not widely accepted. Um, and where we're at for Venus is just those few weird features I showed you. And Ishtar Terra is a huge feature in the northern plains of Venus that, again, very early on in the Mag Magellan mission, people suggested maybe it was related to plate tectonics. But honestly, no one's carried it further um, than that. And if I had more time, that's what I would be actually working on, the, trying to, because n nobody's actually done the detailed work on that, that region that I think could be done with existing data that we have to kind of try to push that further. Um, so again, all we have are these little indications and we don't have any strong evidence, but the way you would go about that is 
more surface composition data, more atmospheric data. Um, if we get a Mars sample return back, I think there's some really interesting um, there's some really interesting isotopics that I heard a guy give a talk on once, and I can't remember. It's a W um, Wolfram. I can't remember the element. It's some element that apparently, when a core segregates from a planet, it this isotope has very certain behavior that we, you can understand the timing of the formation of the core of a planet from looking at this isotopic um, data. So there's data you could get potentially on Earth with giant mass spectrometers um, from a return Mars sample that might help narrow down the answer for Mars at least. Before we go to the black, we have a question online from a member, Carrie Liss. Carrie? -o? The question in short is, how do you get large-scale rifts on Venus without plate tectonics? Good question. We've wondered about that a lot. Um, the problem is the rifts aren't very big. So there's clearly been limited extension. And when I say not very big, the rifts tend to be somewhere between 100 and 200 kilometers, which is big, but not that big. I was just in the East African Rift. Some of them are comparable in scale to the East African Rift. Um, but they're very limited. They don't link up in a way that has plate boundaries. So it's not like the surface of Venus wasn't jostling around. It's not like there wasn't extensional forces and compressional forces. We do, do see folded mountain belts also on Venus that would indicate not just with the rifts where the crust is pulling apart, but other places it's coming together. But what's clearly we don't see evidence of, except that one feature, it are plate boundaries, subduction, which is what you really look for if you're looking for plate tectonics. So you see indications of surface motion, but not enough to add up to plate tectonics. And it's still interior forces that are causing the surface to pull apart and come together. I think we're coming towards the end here, and this might be the last question. Are there any other questioners out there who want to ask a question? Uh, there's, there's one more over here, and one more over there. We'll take those two last ones. Black microphone there. Um, I was wondering what the theory was, what, what the, the extent of the carbon dioxide in Venus, and, and whether it's comparable to any other planets that have been studied. Um, certainly Venus is out, out stands out of the pack in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide. It is a CO2 dominated atmosphere. Obviously our atmosphere is dominated by nitrogen as is Titan's atmosphere. Um, Mars has carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, but not very much. Mars really lacks greenhouse gases and it has a very thin atmosphere, which is partially why it's so cold um, on the surface. Um, so if you look again at the amount of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere of Venus, and you compare it to what we think would be kind of the bulk amount of carbon dioxide on the Earth, it's not that different. It's just, again, our carbon dioxide is tied up in marbles, in limestones, in reefs. Um, so it's just our CO2 is tied up in other forms. And we think the early Earth had much more carbon dioxide, but it was actually erosion kind of, we think, had a big role in kind of pulling it and putting it into the rock cycle. The evolution, there's some people have suggested that the evolution of life help change the composition of our atmosphere from being more CO2 rich. So the fact that Venus didn't go down that path, is that actually an indication that life never did evolve on Venus? Um, we don't know, basically, is the answer. There's lots of theories. There's also a theory that Venus could have gone down because it, the path it did because it didn't have a moon, um, or that it had such a big moon that it crashed into it and changed it and changed its heat profile. There's lots of theories. The problem is we're really shy on data. Um, Blue, the blue microphone out there, and then the red, and then All right. we'll wrap it up. Keith Morgan, retired ABC News, discoverer of the Morgan curve on Mars. Um, have you guys figured out why Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus are all putting out more energy than they're getting from the sun? Because uh, Admiral Truly told uh, students at Dunbar that when we got out to Neptune, we were gonna find a frozen ball of gas because it's so far away from the sun, it's frozen solid. And that was the theory of NASA at the time. And I told him, I wouldn't say that if I were you, but he said it anyway. And he found out, no, it wasn't a frozen ball of gas. It was an active planet. Yeah. Do you guys know where it's coming from? And I don't say it's nuclear because this is not a nuclear universe. It's not nuclear. <laughs> No, I don't, and I know it's especially an issue for Uranus um, that there's this this mystery. And, and again, 
The gas giants are very complicated, and, and one of the things we have certainly learned from um, uh, the mission at Jupiter right now, Juno, um, the Juno mission at Jupiter right now, um, you know, when I went to school, and really up until the time of Juno, you kind of had this diagram of what a gas giant looked like. You know, it was gas, and it got denser and denser and denser, and then you had this ball of solid material at the center, and that was always what we were, you know, when you were shown a cross section of an ice or a gas giant, that was what it looked like. That's not what they found with Juno. They have found very high in the, relatively high in the atmosphere, they think are actually liquid metals. There's all kinds of liquid layers they really don't know. The structure of Jupiter is way more complicated than they had thought, and they're still trying to puzzle through what a lot of the Juno data are telling us. So what you said is true. There's a weird energy balance at the gas giants, but part of the problem is we have not understood the structure of the gas giants, what they're actually like beneath those upper cloud layers. Juno's giving us the first information about that, and it's not at all what we expected. So stay tuned, because I think once we start really puzzling through all the data from Juno, we're gonna get further towards trying to understand those kind of fundamental questions that you think we'd be able to answer, but we can't. Last question will be uh, from our treasurer. Hi, Brett Magram, um, member. So you had me uh, with uh, nuclear-powered refrigerators, and I'm just curious, what technologies do we have and what technologies maybe do we need to develop to have, let's say, a longer-term surface mission on Venus? Thank you. So our proposal actually used an advanced Sterling um, radioisotope generator, um, and um, Venus is actually a good place to use an ASRG. ASRG technologies, um, I have a long and sorted history with ASRGs because my Venus boat mission, or my Titan boat mission was supposed to be powered by one and it ended up not, not going forward. Um, but there are technologies that exist that you could design um, refrigerators for Venus as crazy as it sounds. You know, it wouldn't be cheap necessarily, but. So I have kind of a corollary question. So um, things that go to the surface of Venus are basically disposable because they're not going to last very long. And we have this whole technology now of uh, tube stats and downsizing, and we've actually sent two to Mars, I believe, already, and they've proven to be valuable. How how does that change the approach to exploring Venus? That's a, that's a great question. Um, the advantage that you had with CubeSats is Mar at Mars is, is um, the one thing that CubeSats, the, the real challenge for deep space CubeSats are um, comms, which turns into power and propulsion. Um, so the CubeSats got carried to Mars by a parent spacecraft. They could communicate their data to the parent spacecraft, which then could communicate it back to Earth. So CubeSats are great. You can do cool stuff with them. I would love, I could think of at least, lots of other people have too, at least four different really cool and useful CubeSat missions at Venus. But you have to stick them onto a carrier spacecraft that has the big propulsion systems and the big comm systems, and all of a sudden, we're back at a 450 to $800 million mission. So it's that's the end. It's worth every penny. It's worth every penny. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight and giving this talk and uh, educating us about Venus, our twin, however evil they may be. And before you go, let me present you with a couple of gifts. So, uh, if, uh, there is a signed copy of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, Volume 1 covering the period from March 1871 when it was founded through June 1874. It contains the purposes of the society, the original members, the original bylaws, and why they chose to call it the Philosophical Society of Washington when they really wanted to talk about science. And also a framed copy of the announcement of your lecture signed by all the members of the General Committee on behalf of the membership. Thank you, Ellen, very, very much. Before we adjourn to the social hour, we have a few closing items. First of all, PSW depends on members and sponsors. If you're a member and you haven't paid your 2019-2020 dues, please 
you're overdue. We don't charge late fees, but we'd really like you to pay up your dues. And if you have paid your dues, please consider making an additional donation, sponsoring a lecture, sponsoring a lecture series, or volunteering, volunteering, volunteering to help carry out the society's activities. If you're not a member, please join. You can join easily on the PSW website. You just go to the join button and pull up the link to the membership application, fill out the membership application, submit it, pay your dues. Your membership application will be considered very quickly. You should hear back in a week. And all that really is required is a real interest in science. If you have any questions about membership, please see membership director Lloyd Mitchell in the white shirt in the back of the room or corresponding secretary Robin Taylor who is hiding behind the audio rack because she's been running the live stream. PSW is a nonprofit educational organization, tax exempt under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code and contributions are tax deductible to the extent permitted by law. And all PSW members in good standing may wear the PSW rosette. If you wish to purchase one, $15 plus tax, you may do so at the rosette table in the back of the auditorium, currently being staffed by Cameo Lance, I believe. Our next lecture will be the 2419th meeting of the society here in the Powell Auditorium on February 7th, 2019. The speaker will be Jack Gilbert, who leads the Microbiome Center and is professor in the Department of Pediatrics and professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. He will be speaking on the World Microbiome Project, which he founded, and on integrated microbiomics, understanding microbial populations and how they shape the world. So you would have heard in the lecture that Ellen just gave that there are theories about how dramatically um, biology changed the atmosphere here on Earth. So we will be hearing about how biology, particularly the microbial world, is changing things here on Earth now. The annual president's dinner will be on February 21. And the speaker will be Wacom Frank, professor of biochemistry and molecular biophysics and of biological sciences at Columbia University. He, he is also a distinguished professor of the State University of New York at Albany. He's the inventor and developer of single particle cryoelectron microscopy and methods for cryo-EM determination of molecular structures at atomic resolution. He was awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this work, together with Jacques Dubachet and Richard Henderson. And he will be speaking on single particle cryo-electron microscopy, revolutionary methods for determining molecular structure. The 2,421st meeting of the society will be on March 6th. The speaker will be Rajesh P. N. Rao. He is the Jia and Yun Wang Professor and Director of Neural Systems Laboratory in the Department of Electrical and Chemical Engineering at the University of Washington. And he'll be speaking about brain models, brain chips, brain nets, devising and implementing brain computer interfaces. In particular, he's gonna talk about how we can directly connect human brains to computers. The 2,422nd meeting will be on March 20th. The speaker will be Henrik Christensen, Professor of Engineering, Director of the Contextual Robotics Institute at the University of California, San Diego. And he will be speaking on textual robotics. I do not have the speaker confirmed yet for the 2,423rd meeting on April 3rd. The 2,424th meeting on April 17th will be Wendy Friedman, Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago. And she'll be talking on measuring the Hubble constant and the fate of the universe. As some of you may know, there's a discrepancy between the value of the Hubble constant determined by different methods 
that has yet to be resolved. So it should be a very interesting talk. And then on <coughs> May 1st, we have the 2425th meeting, and the speaker will be Rob Bertram, who is the chief scientist for food safety at USAID, and he'll be speaking on golden rice. It's going to be a very interesting talk, and I highly recommend it to all of you because it shows, uh, it involves a development of a form of rice that has a nutritional addition that was designed to address a specific nutritional deficiency in populations in South Asia that's been kept off the market for 20 years by um, objections to GMOs. And so it's an interesting lecture that will address how we assess the safety of GMOs, how GMOs are made, um, how GMOs compared with crops that are produced by normal genetic, genetic methods, traditional methods of plant breeding and mutagenesis, and the considerations that go into keeping this particular product off the market and what uh, beneficial effects it might have if it could be marketed, and uh, the deficiencies, effects on the populations that are not able to have this uh, plant in their diet and how it affects them. So I recommend this uh, to those of you who are interested in food security and human health and how policy issues affecting GMOs uh, are going to affect all of us in the future. And finally, we have on May 15th, the annual Henry Lecture. And the speaker will be Shep Dolman, who's the founder and director of the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium. He's an astronomer at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, senior fellow at Harvard University. And naturally, he'll be talking about imaging a black hole. And that will complete the standard schedule of 16 lectures, although I think we're going to have at least one extra lecture this year. Please note that PSW is run entirely by volunteers, no paid staff, and without dedicated volunteers, PSW would not be able to stage these free lectures. So those of you who might have some spare time and some skills, we'd be interested to see if you would like to volunteer to do some of the things that need to be done. And if you are, please see me. In the meantime, please thank tonight's crew, James Heelan, our recording secretary, who read the minutes, Cameo Lance, who did room management, live chat, and rosettes, Robin Taylor, who did video setup and breakdown, did the live stream and served as video director, Brett Magram and James Thumser, who ran the cameras, Laurel Kane, who also did room management and helped with our setup, our red, blue, and black mic runners, and the post lecture wrangler, Lloyd Mitchell, thank you all for helping stage this. So after that probably too long post-lecture series of announcements, I will now accept a motion for adjournment of the 2418th meeting of the Society of Social Hour. I have some many seconds. All members in favor? All members opposed? The meeting is adjourned to the social hour. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>